always, it's a joy to be here with all of you. It's a joy to open God's Word together. It's a joy to be reminded of those truths as we just sang them, that by the blood of Christ, our sins are washed away. Love that. Never gets old. Um, We're continuing through the book of Exodus, and I have been really appreciating this series through the book of Exodus. Um, So you're going to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19 today. And my phone's not working, so I might need someone's help back there. But today, um, we, and through, throughout this series, we have seen probably the greatest theme of Exodus, which is God delivering His people and redeeming them for His glory. And so we've been tracing this theme. We've seen it uh, through, their, through God delivering His people and, that were in bondage and slavery in Egypt. We saw the plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart to make God look great and show how great He is and that His name would be glorified. Then the last of the plagues was the Passover, um, and and Ben preached on that, and we saw how he rightly connected that to connections with Christ in the New Testament. Um, They get delivered miraculously uh, just to end up at the Red Sea, where all hope seems lost, and God splits the sea, crushes their enemies under it, providing a way out where Pastor labeled him the God of the impossible. Then, this made Moses and all of Israel erupt in songs of praise, and we saw that in Exodus 15, praising God for who He is and what He has done, as rightly He should be praised. Then, last week, chapter 16 and chapter 17 and chapter 18, we saw um, that they were back to complaining that God is not enough and that they need things like food and water since they were brought to a wilderness And so God provides miraculously again. He fills their complaining mouths with bread, um, and he satisfies their thirst with water from a rock, pointing to Jesus, who is the bread of life and who gives living water. So we saw those connections to Christ. So the faithfulness of God to a sinful people is really astounding as we look at it through the book of Exodus. So now we get to chapter 19, um, and this is talking about Israel on Mount Sinai. And God is leading them with his mighty hand. And the promise from chapter 3, if we, re- if we remember, you can put that slide up there. The promise from chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, is that God would bring them back to this mountain. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But he says to Moses at the burning bush, this will be a sign to you that I'm with you and that I've sent you. I'm going to bring you back to this mountain. So if we remember correctly, Moses was kind of over here in the land of Midian. He comes through back to Israel, who's in slavery in Egypt, and he meets God on that mountain, Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb is what it's called. Um, He meets God on that mountain where the burning bush was. Then he goes to the Israelites that are in Egypt, and then they come back, and now the sign that God is with them is that he would bring them back to this mountain. And so we, we see here in this text that he's also promising at the burning bush that he's going to bring them to a land filled with milk and honey. Okay, And so if you want to show the map up on the screen, I put a big E where Egypt is. The land filled with milk and honey is this one all the way at the top, Okay, where the arrow is pointed to. The Red Sea is the circle closest to the E, and where God leads them to is the circle all the way at the bottom. Okay, So kind of we can see here that he's almost leading them in the opposite direction of the land flowing with milk and honey. And it's because he doesn't forget his promises or his people. So let me read chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. I want you to follow along in your Bibles. It says, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, and on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. Verse 3, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, in a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So the first point today is that God does not forget his promises or his people. So 
you would think the Israelites are probably starting to complain, God, you told us you would bring us to a land filled with milk and honey, this great blessed land, and now here we are, we know where it is, because you said it was the land of the Canaanites and the Hezerites and the Parasites. We know it's supposed to be up there, and yet you are bringing us in the opposite direction, down to a wilderness of sand, desert, and mountains. But again, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12 shows that God is delivering on his promise. He did not forget what he had said. He is showing them that he is with them because he's bringing them back to this mountain where they shall serve him, as you can see on the screen there. So this has been referred to as the mountain of God, and God, again, is delivering on his promise that he is with them. He doesn't forget his promises, and he doesn't forget his people. He doesn't forget about the, Egyptian, or the Israelites in Egypt in the first place, so God does not forget this people that he has set aside for himself. He doesn't and he never will. So take comfort today, and I'm not spending much time on this first point, but take comfort today if you are his, if you are God's. For if you are not, one day you will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. But if you've placed your faith in Christ and you've repented of your sin, one day you hear what he says in Isaiah 49, 15 through 16, and this verse is up on the screen. He talks to the people of Israel and he says, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I can't help but make a connection to Christ, who gets the nails in the palms of his hands. But he has engraved his people on the palms of his hands. God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, does not forget his promises, and he certainly does not forget his people. So take comfort if you are his today. I, I texted Daniel Bouchak, who used to be here. Uh, he, I went to TJ Maxx with him one time, and he bought a pair of golden hands. And I just thought that was the weirdest thing. What are you doing? And he took them home, put them on his desk, and he put that verse on the golden hands. And so I texted him about it, and he said, my wife made me throw those away when we moved. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't have them anymore. But I think that's a great verse. So God doesn't forget his promises or his people. Here's the point that I want to spend most of the time on today, that God establishes his covenant. So we get to this point, which is really one of the greatest heights, no pun intended, but the greatest heights of the book of Exodus as they go to this mountain at Mount Sinai. Now we know, usually, uh, we think of chapter 20, where he gives the Ten Commandments, because this is where he give, gives the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to really mention that today. Um, I want to take a look at this covenant that he establishes. A guy named Gerald Bray defines a covenant as this, a relationship God establishes with people on the basis of his promises. So notice every part of that is very important. It's a relationship that God establishes with people on the basis of his promises. Okay, so in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see that God makes a covenant with Abraham, um, and he says that he's going to make him a great nation, that he's going to bless him, he's going to make his name great, um, all of his family will be blessed. We see that traced all the way to Isaac, his son, Genesis 26, 3 through 5. He says the same exact thing to him. He, he's saying that your offspring will be made great as many as the sand, you know, the stars in the sky. So he's traced, we're tracing this covenant that he made with Abraham, he made it with Isaac, and then we see it again with Jacob in Genesis 28, where he says uh, very similar things to him. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. Your offspring shall be all the families of the earth, and they shall be blessed. So he's saying this to these three patriarchs. And then here we come to the continuation of this covenant that is now going to be made with a whole people group, this offspring of Abraham, Israel. Um, and we commonly refer to this as the Mosaic Covenant, if you've heard it that way before. And I, I want to I wanna liken this scene to a wedding day, if you will, uh, just to give us a mental picture of what's going on here. Um, so you have uh, God, who is the husband of Israel. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. So God likens himself to the husband of Israel, which implicitly makes Israel the bride or the wife, right? And so what you have here, you have all of this people come to the base of this mountain, and Moses, who represents all of Israel, is going 
down the aisle, or shall I say up the aisle, to God who is waiting, the husband, who's waiting at the top of the mountain for Moses, who represents the bride. So Moses is walking up the aisle to God where he is waiting to pronounce the vows. And within this, we must point out that God uses an exclusively godly order to his love for his people. Okay? So look at how God pronounces these vows, if you will, starting in verse 4 in our text here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So here we have on the top of this mountain a frightening scene. The mountain is surrounded in smoke. There's lightning, there's thunder, there's God speaking to Moses, who is representing Israel, and he's saying, um, he first points out in verse 4, I have brought you here. I delivered you. Here's a picture of an eagle with a baby eagle on the back of it. God's like that big eagle underneath. The little baby eagle does nothing to make this flight work, right? He's saying, I bore you up on eagle's wings, and I brought you here to myself. I have delivered you. You have seen what I did to your enemies and how I brought you back here where I said you would come back to. This is what he's saying to them. He then, after that, orders obedience. If you obey my voice and keep my covenant... Then the blessings start. You will be my treasured possession. You will be a kingdom of priests. You will be a holy nation. So notice this order is so contrary to how we as humans interact with one another, right? This might sound more familiar to you. At your workplace, your boss gives you a set of expectations um, and a set of tasks to complete, right? So it starts with ordering obedience. And upon completing those tasks and fulfilling those requirements or expectations, based upon your performance, you might get a promotion and you might get a raise. We're used to that kind of love, if you will, from our workplace, right? But Tim Keller points out here that the obedience that we're used to, or the sequence that we're used to, is obedience, acceptance, blessing. That's what we're used to obedience, and based upon my performance, I might get accepted, and if I'm accepted, then there's a chance I might get a blessing out of that. That's what we're used to as humans. But Tim Keller says, look at this. There's first salvation by grace. God provides salvation first. He then orders obedience by faith to then bless his people. In other words, God did not start with the law. He did not start with the Ten Commandments and say, well, if you obey those Ten Commandments, then I might deliver you and I might save you, and then I'll think about blessing you. He starts with salvation first. He delivers his people out of their trouble, their bondage, their slavery. He doesn't make them qualify for this blessing because we know None of us are worthy of it. So he starts with deliverance. He starts with saving his people. Then he gives them the law. And we'll take a look at that next week when he gives them the Ten Commandments. A lot of us are familiar with those. And he ends it with this blessing. So verse 5, he says, If you obey my voice, if you keep my covenant, you shall be this, that, and the other. So God takes a sinful people who he knew would cheat on him, saves them, brings them on eagle's wings into a wilderness where there's no food, there's no water, there's only God there. He brings them to himself to form a covenantal relationship with himself. The ultimate reward is that we get into a covenantal relationship with God. And then he says, now therefore obey my voice. Now therefore keep my covenant and you will be my people. There's two points I want to make, or two quotes I want to say about this. The first one is from a guy named John McKay. He says, they are not given the law to save themselves. They'd be utterly hopeless if that was the case. They're not given the law to save themselves, but so they might continue to enjoy the salvation they have already received. They receive salvation from God, then are told to obey his voice. The obedience is an act of faith because of what the salvation brings. And another point is, from a guy named Brian Cosby, he says, the reward of commitment, and I want to change this, the reward of covenant is intimacy. So we think of our greatest 
societal relationship we have, which is marriage that God instituted. And we think that's probably what a covenant is, a relationship that is not supposed to be broken, that's supposed to remain together forever, like a crane, as uh, Ernie pointed out to me one time. Cranes mate for life, and they don't mate another. Anyway, we have this uh, relationship of a marriage, but marriage is really a shadow and a metaphor for something much greater, this relationship that God calls us into. So if you think... Marriage is like a bowl of mud compared to the filet mignon of a relationship, a union with the creator of the universe. And so the reward of this covenant is that we get to be intimate with our Savior. The reward of a covenant is that we get to be intimate. So this obedience uh, that he commands here will drive God's people into an ever-increasing joyful intimacy with himself. And we know what happens a little while later. Moses comes down the mountain and there's a golden cow there that they start to worship, right? The covenant doesn't last long. They're already cheating on their maker, their husband. So God has done so much for this people just to hear them complain and then to watch them cheat on him. He brought them into a relationship with himself here, this wedding day um, at Mount Sinai on top of the mountain the creator of the universe, the almighty, the holy God, their deliverer. There is no one greater than him. There is no one better than him. If you have a scale of all the great things of the earth on one side and God lays his one finger on the other side, those great things catapult into the sky. There is no one of higher value than the God of the universe, the God of the Bible. And all he is requiring for his people here is that they be faithful to him. And they can't, or should I say we can't. How many times have we cheated on God? How many times have we placed things of higher value than Him in our lives? How many times have we failed to obey His voice and keep His covenant? So we see through all the rest of the Old Testament, this covenant has problems, not because of the husband, but because of the wife, because of the bride, because of Israel is unfaithful. And really, it's pointing to us as being unfaithful to God. So we, as a sinful people, cannot enjoy fellowship with an almighty God, if we have sin. That is the obstacle. That's what keeps us from enjoying God forever, is our sin. And just real quick, because I think that we get this uh, messed up, look at verse 12 in chapter 19. It says this, And you shall set limits, this is God talking to Moses, You shall set limits for the people around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. So you read something like that and you're like, wow, that's uh, just touching the mountain is, is you, you die if you touch the mountain. What, is, what this is pointing to and what we often miss in our own lives is how great and how awful our sin is. God in all of his holiness is on this mountain and we are so sinful that we just touch it and we're dead. That's how big, how infinite the gap is between a holy God and a sinful creature. I think we often don't recognize that our sin is bad, and it separates us from this God. And then we see how awesome God is in verse 21, if you just go down a few verses there. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through the Lord to look, and many of them perish just looking at the glory of God would kill us. Just seeing him in this state would bring us to death. So we see how sinful we are and how great and awesome God is, and we see there is a gap that nobody can fill, that none of us can fill in between the two of those. So we come before him with our sin, with our unrighteousness, and ashamedly fall at his feet, weeping, saying, we can't do this. We can't hold up our end of the relationship. How can we sustain this relationship? How can we be with you, God? You've done so much for us. You've saved us by grace. You just required faithfulness, and we mess it up time and time again. We want to be in a relationship with you. How is this possible? Look at our sinfulness. We can't even look at who you are in all your glory without perishing. And so the answer to this questioning, or to our questioning, the answer for God's people 
I think is found in Matthew chapter 17. So if you will oblige me, I want to take this picture of this mountain scene, and then this one is very similar, oddly similar, as we see uh, the transfiguration of Christ. There's peals of thunder, peals of lightning, there's a cloud overshadowing. All this is very similar. And so what happens here in Matthew 17, 6 through 8, it says, when the disciples heard this, the thundering and the lightning, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but only Jesus. How will this covenant work? I think the answer is in what the disciples lifted their head and saw. Only Jesus. It's only through Christ that this will work. So obviously something has to be worked out. That brings us to our third point today. God surpasses our sinfulness with more grace. So we know that the Israelites spend much of their time running from God, running away from the prize, which is intimacy with their creator, with God. Um, In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, God raises up a prophet named Hosea to literally marry a prostitute to show how Israel would be completely unfaithful to God while he remains faithful to them. He says, Hosea, take a wife of whoredom and remain faithful to her. She's going to cheat on you. She's not going to be faithful. She's going to run away from you. Remain faithful to her. And this was supposed to be a picture of God and his people. It's incredible. Israel, an unfaithful and completely undeserving bride, in a covenant with a faithful and perfect God. We, as people, as as sinful creatures, completely unfaithful, completely undeserving. And God beckons us calls us in, draws us to himself to bring us into a relationship with him. So let's see how he graciously works this out. Because our sin ruins this relationship. We need some sort of mediator because Moses himself is a sinner and he's not working it out. So we need only Jesus, what the disciples saw in Matthew 17. I want you to turn to Jeremiah 31. And this is where we're going to find this gracious working out that God does because he is loving and compassionate and kind. I'm going to start in verse 31. Chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they broke Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Isn't that an amazing passage? Especially it just wraps up so sweetly there at the end. So God does not double back on his old covenant he made with Israel on Sinai. But he's promising here in Jeremiah, pointing forward to the New Testament, that I'm going to make a new covenant. Instead of putting the law on stone tablets, I'm going to write it on their hearts. Instead of having to be reminded and reminded to know me, all my people will know me. From the least to the greatest. That gives all of us hope, right? A lot of us are in that former category, the least. Instead of sin separating God and his people, sin will be forgiven and remembered no more. We will be his and he will be ours. Just like it was supposed to be. So this new covenant is, in a sense, unconditional. And as a scholar, Philip Ryken, puts it, the only reason this covenant is unconditional is because Christ has kept all the conditions. In 1 Corinthians 11.25, it's up on the screen, Paul comments on what Jesus said at the Lord's Supper, and we took a look at this not too long ago, and we looked at it when we went over the Passover. Jesus says, in the same way, he also took the cup, right, so he's instituting the Lord's Supper here, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus' sinless life, his adherence to the law, his perfect obedience, his sacrificial death, Jesus' victorious resurrection is the basis and fulfillment of this new covenant. By his blood, we enter into a relationship with God. Not without it. So your relationship with God is not based on what you have done. But instead, it's based on what Jesus did for you. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5 and 7 says, They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. He's talking about chapter 19 of Exodus. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than that of the old covenant. He mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Christ brings better promises, a better sacrifice, a better mediator, better everything into this new covenant that makes the old one obsolete, as it says in verse 13 of that same passage. So this new covenant has better promises, has a better mediator, it has Christ. The old covenant on Mount Sinai is obsolete, and now this new covenant in verse Um, In chapter 13, verse 20 of Hebrews is eternal. Where he ends this letter, he says, Now may the God of peace who brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd and sheep of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. He makes an everlasting covenantal relationship. So we can have a covenantal relationship with the God of the universe that sin no longer separates because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what happens in the New Covenant is God delivers us and forgives us of our sin through the life and the death and the resurrection of His Son. And this salvation drives us to obedience by faith and ushers, in, ushers us into the blessings or the reward of the covenant, which is intimacy with God. So our obedience to God shows our commitment to this covenant. We wish to please and honor God the God who saved us by obeying His voice and keeping His covenant. We pursue this relationship with all that we are. With all that we have, we pursue this relationship with God. Look what He did to pursue us. He gave all that He had. He gave Himself, wrapped skin around Himself, lived an obedient life, a perfect, sinless life, and died on the cross and rose from the dead to bring us into a relationship with Him. So, In turn, our obedience by faith in what Christ has done, it requires all of us. Romans 12.1 says that we should live as a living sacrifice. Our bodies are everything. Our ambitions, our motivations, our attitudes, everything is subject to Christ pursuing this relationship. And we are, with all that we are, to kill the sin that keeps us from it. So I don't want to just, I real quickly just want to look, because it's often very easy for us to say, well, Christ has done everything, we're forgiven, Um, this sin does not separate us anymore, that's all good and true. But that does not mean we are lax and don't obey the God who saved us and brought us to himself. We need to kill sin like it's actually keeping us from God. Think about that for a moment. If you thought about your sin like it was actually keeping you from the greatest relationship in your life, you would do all that you could to kill it and get rid of it. Romans 6, 12 through 14 talks about this. Let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for the unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. So real quick, as we wrap this up, I want to turn back to Exodus chapter 19. So we see salvation by grace. God brings his people out of Egypt. God also brings us out of sin and bondage through his son. Then requires obedience, telling us to get rid of our sin, obey his voice, keep his covenant. So then the blessings after that, the reward, the intimacy with him 
comes from that. We see this in verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. <clears throat> These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. We will be his treasured possession among all peoples. Look at this in Titus chapter 2. 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, and notice the order again. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. God saves you, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Obedience by faith to God. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The blessing is intimacy with Christ. A kingdom of priests, Revelation chapter 1, 6. And he made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The next one is Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Again, notice the order here. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. All of this language is hearkening back to Exodus 19, where he says, these are going to be evident of you if you are my people. Christian, today you are a priest and the church globally is a kingdom that God is setting up. I know we don't talk like that, but that's what it says here. And, and more so, we see this when we see that we are a holy nation in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. He's talking to believers. A holy nation. Remember, he said that was going to be evident of us in Exodus 19. A people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. These blessings of the covenant are fulfilled through the blood of Christ. And this is our positioning in the face of the Almighty God. He treasures us. He has made us a kingdom. He's made us priests. He's elevated our status way above what we deserve, adopting us into his family as sons and daughters. Praise be to God, the God of the covenant, for who he is and what he has done. So if you miss everything that we just went over today, Notice this, the scene at Mount Sinai, you have Moses representing Israel, going all the way to the very top of the mountain to get to God. God brings them into a covenant that Israel would ultimately be unfaithful in, representing us. This covenant is a shadow of a better covenant to come, which is filled, fulfilled in Christ, who is God who instead of us going up to him on the mountain, comes down the mountain all the way to the cross. And at the expense of his life, brings all those that would trust in him to God himself to be his treasured possession. In this covenant, what we get far outweighs what we deserve. We get to be in relationship with God. And God did not save us. Notice this, and please understand this. God did not save us so that we would get riches or good health or fame or popularity. What a shame it would be if he saved us just so that we could get rich and die and live apart from him. What a shame it would be if he saved us so that we would have good health the rest of our life. We're never promised any of those things. But what God did is he saved us to bring us to himself. He brings them into a wilderness. They're wondering, why aren't we going to the promised land? You know why? Because I am in the wilderness. Only me. Your only need. Obey my voice, and we'll bring you to the blessings to come. Israel getting out of Egypt and us going to heaven isn't even the main point of being saved. So get that out of your head. I know we think that all of our lives, well, I just got to make it to heaven. Yes, that's true. That, that is promised. But heaven is not the main point. The main point is that we get to be in everlasting life in an intimate union, covenantal relationship with the God of the universe, the almighty, powerful, holy God. And we get to enjoy this for his glory and our joy forever. Nothing 
tops that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've done. That not by our performance or by our adherence to the law, you saved us. But of your own volition, you have come, delivered us on eagle's wings, brought us to yourself to enjoy everlasting, intimate relationship with you. And you've done this by crushing your son on the cross in our stead. May we not miss that. May we look to you, the author, perfecter, founder of this relationship, and pursue you above all else. Help us to obey your voice. Keep your covenant as you are bringing us together to be kingdom of priests and a holy nation and a people that you treasure. God, thank you for lifting us high, putting us on your top shelf, treasuring us when we did not deserve it. Thank you for being faithful when we are utterly unfaithful to you. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross so that we could enjoy you forever. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.